Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves going again. What we want to do for the second part of the session is really start by talking about the whole model integration kind of coordination system and how we get the models out and ultimately share the models and really what some of the differences are between them. As we go through and think about like the different models we're creating right now, we mostly have an architectural model, a, a structural model, and they're separate. And we do want to get those together so you can sort of see everything working together. Let's just kind of talk about how that works for each of them. For this part, oh, what would be good? I think in Canvas, let's go over there and see which models we want to work with. We could work with the Audubon Center. Uh, let's go for the Audubon Center example. If you want to go through and pull down those, you probably already have them because they have existed for a while now kind of uh, out there in the Canvas system. If you go ahead and pull down the architecture and the structure, that's probably the best thing to go ahead and get ourselves started with. So the way it basically works is if I go over to Revit, typically as just I'm working with things, I can go through and basically link the files together. Let me go ahead and close this out. The idea is that the architect has probably created an architectural model. The structural engineer linked to it so they could place the structural elements. And then what typically happens on the other side is the structural engineer's model can be linked back into the architecture. So you sort of see it both ways. But it always has that look but can't touch sort of quality to it. So for example, I go over to Sustainable Design Center. Oops, what do I have there? Nope. That's this. Let me find my Audubon ones. I keep them in a funny place on my own folder. <laughs> BIM demo, let's say Audubon Center, Revit files. This is where they are for me. I'll go ahead and open up uh, the structural file. You'll see the structural file. It's pretty well developed. But what we'll do is link it on back. Okay, opening, opening, opening. Okay, here's our structure for the center. You can sort of see a little pier and grade beam system around the edges. Some steel columns coming up, some light gauge joists kind of slightly tilted. It's actually a pretty simple structure. You see a little X bracing in there to provide some of that lateral resistance. It's kind of a one way brace. You see some X bracing on the interior sides. But take a look at it. It's a good little model of a real building. Okay. And the idea is that all these elements are changeable by the structural engineer. Depending upon what is loaded or linked to it right now, let me go to manage, and I'll manage the links. Okay, looks like the architecture isn't linked to it right now. If I wanted to add that in, I could do it from here. I could also do it from the insert menu and say link it there, but if I choose that, I say origin to origin, and say link it. You'll see it'll show up in the background let that do its thing and it'll be sort of a look but not touch sort of affair a little bit of regenerating going on Okay. okay, what's happening here, again, I don't see very much. The reason is from the architecture or the structural standpoint, I'm really only seeing things that are structurally related because this discipline filter turned on. It says structural right here, so it's only showing me what it considers to be the structurally related items. If I wanted to, I could change that over to coordination. 
Okay? And then I'd see a broader range. I'd tend to see things, more of the architecture elements. It's still controlled by visibility graphics. So if curtain walls are turned off and things like that in visibility graphics, you still might not see everything. At least I have the main walls. I kind of pop it in there. And then I can use visibility graphics to sort of turn on some more things. Now, what I tend to do, and as you work, probably the best thing to do is actually start to maintain two different views of all your model views, so, or two different versions. I'll keep the structural one hanging around. Okay, this is my default 3D view over here. What I'll tend to do is come over here and duplicate this view and just be real explicit about it because 3D with brackets is actually a working view. So as a working view, and you keep on changing things, it's always altering, and uh, you're never quite sure what's going to be there. What I'll usually do is say duplicate this. You can say with or without detailing. In this case, it's not going to matter. Detailing is more important in plan views, annotations, uh, dimensions, things like that. So I'll call this one my 3D uh, structural, just so I can pop through there really quickly. I can duplicate that view again and call it 3D architectural, or 3D coordination might be a better name for it. And I'll rename that 3D coordination again. So far all I've done is change the name. I haven't really changed the functionality. But then for this view, with this new improved name, I can go through and say, let's go ahead and change it over so that, oh, it's a coordination view. And again, I could decide to turn on some more features if I want to. But again, because I am in the structural model, all those architectural features have that funny quality, look but not touch. You see, when I try to touch them, I get the big blue box. I can tab and sort of get that wall, but you see it's grayed out to me. I really can't go through and make any changes to it. So it's finishing loading the uh, wall information, but all the things that I might want to go through and change are sort of grayed out. I can't really do very much to it. Okay. So this leads to the whole issue of, hey, it's nice to be able to kind of see things this way, but it's somewhat crippled in terms of seeing this way. It's really kind of hard to like, uh, see some of the things you would want to, so you'd like a better system for viewing these things. And that's where BIM 360 is the whole picture. There's really two different sort of sharing systems that we can use outside of Revit. One's A360 and one's BIM 360. And A360 lets us take any individual model and upload it to the cloud and then kind of look at it so that you can send anyone that URL and they can kind of look at it on a web page or look at it through an email message, whatever you want to do. The other one's BIM 360. BIM 360 is a paid service, okay? It has more features. It's good for clash detection and coordination between different models, okay? So not everyone has access to it. We all have access to it because we're students here, but not everyone does. So A360 is the more generic solution. BIM 360 is a little more involved. Okay, for BIM 360, well, let's talk about the A360 path first. Okay, so I've got these models, they're linked, everything's kind of looking good here, that's kind of fine, super. Let me go ahead and I'll just save this as my linked model, just so I can have it somewhere. I'll say, let's go to the project. I'm just gonna put it on my desktop for now, so I can find it easily. Just kind of keep track of what I have in there. Okay, when it's time to upload to A360, most of you already figured out how to do this. You pretty much, the easiest way is actually to go to the A360 website and just post it there. You upload it just as a Reddit file. So when you want to do that, 
what you'll do is go to your nearby browser. You'll say, let's go over to the student.revit or student, what's it down? It's, it's uh, Stanford Revit. Dot Autodesk 360. Is it Autodesk360.com like that? I always have trouble remembering this. It comes up automatically on, it looks like it actually did resolve. <laughs> okay. Check it out, not available this weekend. Don't go here from two to six. Okay, if I wanna upload things here, what I'll do is I'll go to the spring class. Come on in, you can work here, come on. All right. We can say, let's go to my nearby folder. Just grab your folder. Say that you wanna upload things. Let me get this from Dropbox or anywhere I want to. Looks like I can get a whole folder now. That's pretty good. The idea is A360, in some ways, it's like Dropbox. I think that's the way they're positioning it. We'll choose that. We'll say OK. And it's going to upload the file that can be shared now. And when you put things out here in the system, you can go through and give people a link to it so they can download it or people can also view it just from a web interface. And that's what it's doing right now. It's going through and trying to figure out all the viewable views of all that, and it's gonna display that. Now, this system is really nice and easy. It works very kind of simply. The only real limitation to this is that it only works for one model at a time. So if I'm really looking at the structural file or the architectural LinkedIn, I am just betting you the architectural files will going to be there, but the architectural is not. It doesn't actually pick up the link. Close that down over there. We'll just let that kind of keep on working. As we want to go through and share that, we have this idea right here. Uh, we can download the file, so anyone who has, go, can get to this page can download it. Or you can say that you want to share it. Sharing, we can do a couple different things. We can go through and say that we want to copy the link. So anyone who has that link can see your file and look at it either on an iPad or a Chrome browser, something like that. So you can send that to mom, you can send that to all your friends, anyone can look at your files. Okay? You can either copy it and take it over somewhere. You can come on over here and email it to someone. Okay? Or you can do something called embedding it. And let me kind of tell you about that just as we're going. Copying the link is actually kind of a really good thing. That's what most people have been doing so far. I said if you, when you're posting the design journal, just grab that link and copy it and paste it. And what happens is then when you go to the token, you click on that link and it opens it in this interface. And that's actually not too bad in the scheme. So that's kind of okay. If I go over to Bimtopia, just as an example, and we go to a nearby recent project, that we have here. Uh, is that you, Carl? No, that's, Carl, that's, that's going to have to be a 360 link, not an A360 link. Great, let's take a look. So here we have some nice pictures. That looks kind of good. Lots of nice pictures. Come pop it on down here. There's the link. If you would click on that link, oh, that's the BIM 360 yeah, link, right? I don't have an A360 link. No worries. You can click on the link, you'll go through and get to being able to get to that model. What I want to show you is that there's actually another way to do it that's even kind of a little bit cooler if you are so inclined. What we can do is not only sort of put the link there, you can actually embed the whole model there. So let me kind of show you what that looks like. What you can do is as follows. Oh, let's go ahead and I'll get into the system. I have so many IDs, which one am I going to use? Uh, hang on. Although none of them show here. Try that again.
I'm very bad because I have a hard time remembering all these like uh, URLs and stuff like that. Okay, so if I want to go to the design journal site, oh, actually, I'm in at the main site. If I say that I want to go through and create a new journal entry, actually, I should do this as one of you guys instead because it's, it's going to look a little bit different in my interface in a kind of way that is almost too easy to do it. Let me come back over here. Uh, what do I want to do here? Log in more in the standard way. If I want to add a new entry the way you have been doing it, a new item. We have many appointments. Come on back. Okay. Uh, put the title in there. That's all fine. Okay. Back over here, if I would like to go through and share my fabulous like model in a way that is actually a little bit stronger, I can click on the embed link. And what the embed link lets you actually do is copy in a whole lot of code right here. This code is actually very nice code. This code is not only sort of uh, the pointer to it, but it actually talks about the height and width of how big it can be and what about the work in the interface. So if you copy that, and you come back over to your article, somewhere back over in here, you need to paste it in here. Now when you paste it in here, if you're going to put a little HTML code in here, yeah, this is actually the HTML that looks like uh, it's not uh, kind of cleaning everything up uh, the way it's going to properly be displayed. If you flip over to showing the code, which is this view, okay, this is some text, and I can paste in that iframe. What that code is actually going to do is go through and put a live link to the file in there. So let's show you what that looks like. I'll go ahead and just in the same sense come back over here and I go through and associate it. Actually, I never, I never just associate it with myself. So Peter, you're it again. And then I should put myself in the list.
ברוך השם. מסבל. The nice thing about this article, let's see if we can actually see it. I think this is going to just edit it as opposed to splitting it. No? This is some text. It looks like the embedded is not actually working just yet. Let me see if it actually kind of wiped it out. Hmm. That should have worked over here. I copied all that code. That part's looking good. Let me go back over, take a look at that entry. Let's try editing it down over here. I might need to go through and enable this for you guys. Hmm. I'm going to go through and play around with that a little bit, show you actually what I have in mind. I'll fix that. What the effect of all this is, if, for example, if I go to, actually not this site, we go to Barrington instead. Oh, there's a test case out here. What it'll actually do is just open a real A360 window just right in the interface. I think it should do that. So it's up. There it goes. Okay. So even from the web now, you can go ahead and see the uh, model. You could also go popping out towards specific views. So it's a really nice interface in that people can do this just directly from the web and get right into your model without even having to open it up. So just kind of a nice way of doing it. I'll enable that. I think it's got to turn on the design journal so you can do the same thing in terms of putting it in there. But A360 tends to be a very good way to be accessing all this information. Let's go back over here. Come back over to, here's my sample. There's the Audubon right there. Let's see if it's up now. If you just gave me the link, this is what I'd get. And most of you are sort of used to this by now. Not embedded, one click away, but again, not too awfully bad. And I take that back. Check this out. It looks like the link, oh, and this is the structure model. This is the structure model without the architecture linked in. So notice there's no architecture, we can't get to that. So we're only looking at a single view and model. That's the limitation we're doing at this slide of day 360. Okay, BIM360 is the one that gives us a little more capability in terms of thinking about things being uh, from BIM 360, what you got to do, though, is work a little bit differently. You have to basically come on over here. You're in the structural model. I can go through and kind of choose a view here. And when you have BIM 360 installed under the Add-ins tab, you'll find Glue. If Glue doesn't work, again, the problem is something with just the versioning and you need to update your version of Revit using the application manager. We'll select the host. I'll say it's going to go to BSI Glue. Then we go through and choose the project and which view we want to upload. Spinning. Let's see what we have here. Go back to Revit. There's Peter's project. Maybe I'll pick on that one just because it's close by. We're not flashing today. see you right now. Okay. What it's doing is pulling up everyone's project right there. The nice thing about gluing is you can glue things from all the different like sides. Although you actually have a choice. Let me show you an important choice. 
If you want to see it all together and walk through it in uh, the glue environment, you can either go through and upload all the different versions of the files separately. You can upload the architectural, you can upload the structural, and merge them together. Okay. Or you can actually upload them together. And if this ever stops slashing, we'll show you how that works. messing around. I think I'll wait. Okay, we'll go into Peter's project. Just because it's right at the top of the list will be easy. I can choose which view I want to put in there. Again, actually, what will get pasted in, I should warn you about this, is really only whatever is visible in the 3D view right now. So it's typically good to set up a 3D view that has everything in it that you want. If I have this somewhat limited view, that's what's going to get posted in there. But as I say next to this, I can go through and choose to put it in a folder. I'm going to go through and put in, I have some Glenn stuff that I try to keep off the side because I keep on picking on your folder. Under more options, we have the choice here of whether you include the linked files. That's kind of an interesting choice. If you say include the linked files, it'll give you not only the structural elements, but it'll also give you the linked architectural elements. Okay, and put them in at the same time. That kind of sounds convenient. The disadvantage of doing it that way, though, is that it's all sort of buried inside of the structural file. So if the architect updates things, or if you have an updated architectural file, you almost have to turn off the architectural file that is showing through structure and then bring it in separately. So in some ways, I prefer to bring them in separate. Then you have the ability to kind of control which versions you merge against each other. Okay. But you can either include those or not. If you say glue it, it'll go through and update itself. In terms of what happens after it does get glued, let's go ahead and kind of show it over here again. Close down Revit over here. Looks like the BIM 360 glue application is updating itself a little bit. On your machine, if you don't have the BIM 360 glue application, you probably got it at one point, because when you signed up for the site, it gave you some link to download it. But if you don't, the thing to do is basically go to, from your Windows side, always go to, it is b4.autodesk.com desktop. If you do that, it'll go to the glue side and it'll start downloading here in terms of launching that application, I'd say that's a little security one thing right here. I would say do nothing for mine. But this will basically download the application and install it on your machine. So if you got that, what will happen is when you go to BIM 360 Glue, okay, sign ourselves in. We'll say that we're going to go to the BSI glue site and go off and open up that folder. Now, the interesting thing that happens is if you have what uploaded something to glue and you received a link to go to glue, but you don't have the glue application installed, it will open in the Chrome browser. And the way you can tell it opened in the Chrome browser, it'll look amazingly similar, but the option to merge files isn't there. That's the part that's kind of the tell that you don't quite have the entire interface. If you do have the entire interface, 
Let's see if we can do this. I'll go to spring. There is Mr. Peter right there. We'll open that. Okay. We now see create a new merge model. So you'll see that there is a number of different models kind of all set up. Okay, they're kind of currently gluing themselves in there. You can open them independently. If you want to create a nerd new model, which you'll say is new merge model, and you'll choose the different versions you want to put together. So I can get oh, this architectural and this structural together. I can get a name. Merge that together. And it'll open it up. Now, if you want to share the integrated model, the view of that, the person who's going to be viewing this will still need to have Gun360 Glue. Okay? Yeah, they'll need to have that. If they don't have that, I think it'll try to download Glue if they're sort of understood as being a real user. Here's the, app, here's the file. It's actually very fluid to work in this interface and see how things work together. In fact, if you want to, we can come on in. We go walking on up. Oh, works a little different in A360. Here I have to walk like this. Pan on down. Go walking on in. So we're looking around the center. We can sort of see how things are going. Look around. Okay. If you want to share this view, what you need to do is, if you come over and say, I want to create a view, it's going to be my new view. And I save that away. What happens is it creates a link. And you can send yourself that link. Okay. And that web link is something you can copy and put into your design journal if you want to go ahead and allow people to click on that link to uh, get to this. If you just do it directly from mail, it'll take you from here. But it takes a little bit more work to kind of try and capture the link to get into the 360 So think of 8360 as being the incredibly easy to get to, anyone with Chrome can get to it sort of interface, but it doesn't show you everything. Whereas Bing 360, for people who have access to that interface, gives a much more accurate view of how everything works together and starts to allow, oh, what we'll get into is clash detection. So you're over here, we can say, let's go through and find some clashes. I'll just start by saying, let's go ahead and see any clashes between oh, the structural framing. Got to give this a name. And do not be alarmed. The first time you do this, there's always a bazillion things because that's a very precise number. There are a lot of things where they're just, because of the way we model things, clashes built into it, and that's kind of okay. So you can click on any of these clashes. It'll take you to that point in the interface where we can actually sort of see what it is. It looks like some wall is conflicting with some sort of W shape right now. That kind of tends to be okay. We could also group them around. We'll talk more about this. Oh, if I want to group it by the architectural element, you can see I have 45 things that are conflicting with the roof right now. And we're going to learn to start thinking about these things in terms of, oh, what's a valid clash and what's not a valid clash. Because a lot of things, just based on the way we're modeling things, run into each other. And that's going to be quite, quite OK. So don't worry about that. OK. Let us go ahead and finish up for today. I'm just going to start talking about HVAC. But we will uh, kind of continue this next time in terms of actually doing the modeling. At a high level, the thing I like to tell you about HVAC systems more than anything as you get going is just really start observing everything around you because you just basically are living in a world of HVAC systems and they're above your head and on the walls constantly and you'll learn a lot.
itself by looking at them and trying to understand what's going on. And we'll take a look at some pictures, you know, from oh different things I've seen. Gustavo found an interesting picture to share today. But there's basically a lot of HVAC around you all over the place. So start by just looking around. If we think about what's really driving HVAC systems, and especially when we're talking about moving air around, there's really two big criteria we're trying to deal with. One is the whole issue of freshness. We want to keep a certain amount of fresh air moving through. And it's really driven by two different criteria. There's sort of a number of a certain amount of air changes we want to keep introducing, just so the air doesn't get stale. And if you've ever walked into a room that just sort of feels heavy and dank and kind of had that locker room feel to it where it's just a little bit humid and it feels like the air has been sitting in there, and sometimes it happens when you go to grandma's house and she doesn't open the windows as much often as she should. You get that sort of issue of the air just being not as fresh as it needs to be. And air changes starts to address that. And for any room, we'll look at, oh, for example, in a room like this room, we can say that there's a certain number of air changes per hour we'd like to introduce. And we can say, great, let's figure out what the volume of this room is, the height, the length, the width, compute a certain number of cubic feet. And if we need to change four times an hour, we can figure out how many cubic feet we need to move every minute. Okay, and that's really the principle behind really a lot of the modeling we'll do. We're gonna basically figure out just how much air we need to move through to kind of just keep it fresh. The other side of it though that we sort of use to guide our thinking is that not only do we need to move the air, because often we recycle air, we also need to put in a little bit of completely fresh air, some air from the outside. And you kind of know this in your car, if you have one of those recycle the air versus not sort of buttons. If you recycle the air, especially on a hot day, the good news is you're taking the chilled air that's already somewhat cool, recycling it so it stays very cool, okay, but it's not very fresh. Okay? Whereas if you introduce the outside air, you get a lot of fresh air, but you have to spend a lot more energy to cool it down to get it to an acceptable temperature. So, what we try to do is go through and get all the air we need move through, but then we'll introduce a certain percentage as fresh air. Okay, and we'll look at some formulas that guide us. There's big tables that really say exactly for every different type of functionality, how much fresh air we need to introduce for every different type of building or uh, room use. And those two things will ultimately tell us how we go through and like, uh, introduce air. The second side of the equation that we'll get into is really just using air as a way of moderating temperature. So we can go through and introduce air that's either warmed or cooled to bring the temperature down or bring it up. Okay? And that's usually almost a secondary thing as we go through and work. There are a lot of ways we heat and cool air, or heat and cool space. Air is only one of them. Turns out air is not even the most efficient way to do it. It's just sort of the easiest way that we did in the past, so we have a lot of air handling needs to do that. But for where we're going, we're gonna look at it from both those perspectives. We're gonna look at it in terms of both moving air, okay, in terms of doing the basic ventilation, what we need to do there, as well as providing the thermal comfort, where we're gonna go through and figure out just both sort of a certain amount of air we'd have to introduce to heat the space or cool it, okay, and then figure out really how big a system would have to be behind it to basically push that amount of air to kind of get it through a whole system. And where we'll go with this is in terms of modeling it in Revit, you will come up with models that look like this. Go back over to Revit. how to create models that look like, uh, oh, yeah, here. Actually, I'll do the next one. Something like this. In each of the different rooms, it's a simple little model here. You think 
do you think, do you think? Actually, I should have built in the other one, so now it's got a very interesting HVAC model to it. Finish regenerating. It's the longest 100% you ever waited for. Systems that look something like this. What you're looking at is a system that has an air handler. In this case, it's up on the roof. We have some ductwork, which is basically supplying some supply air and some return air. In this case, the supply air is coming through the roof pipes. The return air is coming through sort of the uh, kind of agenda pipes. But what's happening is this basically has a series of ducts which connect out to the different rooms. The rooms have a series of different air terminals that are supplying the air. And for every room, we both supply and remove an equivalent amount of air, because you want to keep it in belts. You don't want to go ahead and have an over-pressurized room or an under-pressurized room. When that happens, either doors open by themselves, or you can't open doors. Okay, or you have infiltration or different sort of leaking problems. And what we'll do next time is really learn how to place these different air terminals on the ceiling at a specific level. And then for those air terminals, You'll see they're all rated at a certain CFM. So what we tend to do is go through and figure out really how much CFM, how much flow we need to reach the rooms, place those terminals, and then link them all together as a series of ducts to tie back to an air handler. Okay, so that's the big overview of where we're going next. Okay, any finish up questions for today? No? We are, yes? You're just ready, okay. Then let's go ahead and we will adjourn for today and just kind of start with uh, some of the office hour stuff and like uh, just kind of keep your models moving along. <laughs>